mining throughout its history has been a contested terrain without fixed borders or unified identity, repeatedly caught in the middle of bloody struggles between world powers. Again today, Ukraine, whose very name means borderland, is caught between the US and Russia over contested borders, economies, and ideologies, in what some have warned may lead to a new Cold War. The major narratives describing current events in Ukraine could not be farther apart, straining the fragile ceasefire as we speak. On one hand, the U.S. and its mainstream media, in a remarkably singular, singular voice, accuse Russia's Vladimir Putin of threatening a new Cold War by aggressively provoking the current instability in Ukraine, illegally annexing Crimea, threatening an invasion along Ukraine's eastern border, compared by some to Hitler's early annexations, and fueling violent separatists in the east. This narrative dismisses the legitimacy of the referenda for secession held by Crimeans and pro-Russian separatists, and endorses instead the recent not fully representative presidential election of Petro Poroshenko. A second narrative, very different, largely ignored by US media, explains the same events as the result of yet another US-engineered coup that forced a regime change friendly to Western economic interests and NATO's eastward expansion to Russia's borders. This narrative points to the presence at Maidan of high-level State Department officials and to CIA Director John Drennan's visit to Kiev, apparently to support Kiev's military offensive, aided by Ukrainian fascist elements against the so-called terrorists in the East. This narrative is illustrated by Obama's recently announced buildup of US military presence in Eastern Europe. Itself could be seen as a provocation toward a new Cold War. So those are the two stark narratives. Rochester Against War and the Ukrainian National Women's League of America are sponsoring this public forum to provide more nuanced accounts of unfolding events in Ukraine, ones that go beyond these two narratives and include the varying perspectives of Ukrainians themselves. Our panelists have the experience and expertise to address these complex issues, and we want to tap as well the experience and expertise of you in the audience to help us all understand what's going on in this dangerous corner of the world. Brief presentations of five or 10 minutes by the panelists will be followed by a roundtable discussion among them, followed by question and answer with the audience. To introduce the panelists, Olena Popovich is Assistant Professor of Political Science, Nazareth College. She's Director of Legal Studies and Free Law Advisor, and her research interests include American government and politics, constitutional history, and comparative healthcare policy. A native of Ukraine with family there, she has been a close observer of these last month's unfolding events in Ukraine. Matthew Leneau is Associate Professor of History and Department Chair at the University of Rochester. His field is European history with specialties in Russian and Soviet history. He is engaged in research on the experiences of Soviet infantrymen during the early Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union and the history of propaganda and surveillance worldwide. Joe Crescente holds graduate degrees from Indiana University in Russian and Ukrainian studies and anthropology from New York University. Recently, he returned from two years working for a State Department Finance nonprofit organization in Moscow. He's founder of the Indiana University Ukrainian Studies Organization and has written for many publications on topics relevant to the region. Before we begin, I want to thank Gail Maud and Ducey for this wonderful space, and uh, Melissa Sitter of the local branch of the Ukrainian National Women's League of America, who has graciously offered to moderate the discussion. So I'd like to introduce Elena to begin. 
First of all, um, thank you very much to Doug, uh, personally, who organized uh, this forum, to the organization that stands behind them, um, and most of all to those of you who took uh, the time to come here this evening. Um, on this muggy, <laughs> rainy. Can you see in the mic? Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. Is this better? I don't know. But is this better? Yeah, it's uh, okay. It's okay. All right. Um, I would like to agree at the start um, with uh, what Doug just said. It is quite clear that the events. this would be the ideal distance. Okay, all right. First, uh, I must agree uh, with Doug on the following proposition. The events in Ukraine, just as any other world shaping events, Iraq, Syria, are immediately um, engaged by the various media streams, which are, of course, neither objective nor neutral, but into various political um, and party machines, media machines that exist in every part of the world, in the United States, in Europe, in Russia, in Ukraine itself. And so it is not surprising at all that uh, we would see the development of uh, very different narratives about what is going on in Ukraine. Um, and I think the critical um, approach to these narratives, the analysis of the positions of the speakers in these narratives are central for informed citizenry in order to form their own uh, position on, on these issues. Um, on the other hand, um, I will not be able to help very much with this task um, since uh, uh, for the past, what is it, six months now? I can't believe this. Um, I've been entirely absorbed in uh, reading uh, mostly Ukrainian, but also some Russian media. There's only so many hours in the day and I found that I've spent many a day, literally a day, reading only the Ukrainian language and a bit of Russian language media, leaving me no time to analyze or critically assess the uh, narratives that are, I'm sure, uh, appearing in the Western media. But uh, in this sense, I'm useful in another way. Um, here I can represent to the best of my ability the uh, stories, the narratives, the reporting, the analysis, um, are very broad, fairly heterogeneous, and uh, uh, media in Ukraine and also some Russian language media, for the most part, the remnants of the independent Russian media. Um, there, too, there is not a one mind about everything that's going on, but I have found that given you know, <laughs> that I'm spending an inordinate amount of time reading uh, and viewing what is going on in my homeland, um, that Ukrainian media is really the best source. And if we're gonna hear the stories um, of the people uh, who are suffering, who are concerned, who are incredibly stressed out at this turn of events, that that is a really good source. And in fact, of course, in all of this, we should be mindful that first and foremost, this is the story of Ukraine. This is not the story of the West. This is not the story of Russia, and this is not, or shouldn't be, a story of geopolitical struggle. So I just would like to make three points at the opening because the main plan here is for the discussion. The first point has to do with uh, a bit of terminology, I guess. It's perfectly fine to say that there's a crisis in Ukraine, and in fact, you know, uh, many a uh, Ukrainian spokesperson you know, they kind of report from the media room in the background of which there is a crisis media, you know, sort of background, and the word crisis is used pretty liberally. But in the situation of information war, in addition to actual war, um, the terminology does become important. Um, and I would say that it is best not to conceive of what's going on in Ukraine as a crisis, because it implies, I think, more inter internal affairs. And what is going on in Ukraine is certainly not a civil war. Certainly, this term is wrong for the American context, the context that is mostly informed by the civil war as understood through the prism of the civil war in this nation, a largely internal affair of the confrontation between two economic, political, and cultural systems within the borders of the same nation. What is going on in Ukraine, first and foremost, most worrisomely, um, is undeclared but pretty obvious aggression from the side of Russia. 
This aggression follows what can be rightly called a revolution, or at least an ousting of the government that, that you know, is known by the name of Euromaidan. Um, and Russian aggression is again also clearly a revenge, a response to the ousting of the government that was pro-Russian, uh, deeply corrupt, convenient in a variety of ways to the Russian Federation. So we have a war, um, an aggression that is supported by Russia. Um, luckily, it is not yet overwhelmingly successful, but nonetheless, it is a military aggression. My second point for now, we can come back to this one uh, in, in a variety of ways, is that the support for secession in the Donetsk and Luhansk regions of Ukraine is not very significant. Um, Certainly, there are Ukrainian residents and citizens who um, oppose central government in Kiev for a variety of reasons. They have a number of grievances, uh, from unemployment to uh, sort of existentialist cultural, cultural orientation towards the West versus Russia. But the supporters of secessionists are a clear minority. And the aggression and the military confrontation goes on because of the compulsion and uh, the climate of fear uh, created by people who took up arms. In fact, there are many cases in which people are forcibly recruited to work for or even to fight with the pro-Russian, uh, sometimes the <laughs> Russian separatists. Um, and this is perfectly understandable because um, there really is uh, no deep reason or set of reasons for uh, the residents of Ukrainian East, let alone South, to want to secede from Ukraine. Um, the stories of the discrimination of, of the Russian speakers are entirely open not even overblown, but mostly fabricated. I know that very well myself. I'm Ukrainian, but my first language is Russian. And I too come from, and my family still is, in a proud Ukrainian city, which nonetheless for historical reasons has been deep, has been uh, russified, uh, where most residents uh, grew up uh, speaking Russian language first and then learning Ukrainian language later. Um, so I know very personally the realities of language, politics, and realities in Ukraine. <laughs> Is this better? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. We found the solution soon enough. Um, so uh, so it is pretty clear that the support is uh, slim that without the support of Russian Federation, this uh, calamity would be put down pretty fast, which is why, of course, uh, Russia here is a holding a decisive stay, uh, but not the only stay. Um, my last and closing point, we'll have plenty more time for discussion, is that I believe um, really 90% of Americans, be they on the left, right, or center in their political orientation, uh, should, after careful examination of what's going on in Ukraine, clearly support Ukraine and, uh, and, 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 and uh, condemn, uh, I guess I'm gonna use that word, yes, condemn uh, the actions of the Russian Federation. Um, now here, what's important here is to understand, first of all, what Ukraine stands for, what Euromaidan, as very much the current will of Ukrainian people, stands for and secondarily to understand what are the Russians' goal, goals and aims in the region. Uh, despite the massive propaganda campaign to portray Euromaidan as a right-wing and even fascist creation, um, Euromaidan has been incredibly heterogeneous, um, multi-ethnic, multicultural, multilinguistic uh, movement with multiple, multiple political orientations, uh, the members of this uh, civic movement and uprising span the entirety of European political spectrum, and that is larger than American political spectrum. 
And the right-wing forces, I must say, are in clear minority. Um, nationalism in Ukraine, as a nation that can be compared to a post-colonial nation, is not a right-wing phenomenon. It is actually a force and a goal that aligns itself with liberal values, with left values, because nationalism here is a force for liberation of Ukraine from authoritarian past. Um, to sum it up, your Maidan stands for liberalization and democratization of Ukraine and against the depths of corruption, un pretty much unmatched in the rest of the world, into which the administration of Yanukovych has thrust the Ukrainian economy and society. No matter what you think about the European Union, and you may have a fairly low estimation of its democratic or social achievements or economic achievements, compared with Russia, it is clearly a desirable alternative or, if you'd like to be very critical, a lesser evil. So Ukraine's choice, Ukraine's choice of pro-Western, pro-European orientation is perfectly rational. Is it ideal? Is it leading Ukraine into a paradise? There are no such things on the offer, on the menu of current choices for Ukrainian citizens. But they're making a rational choice to run away as far as they can from the growing and dangerous authoritarianism um, and even religious fundamentalism of the strange Russian Federation that we're seeing uh, here. Um, after the dashed hope of some kind of European integration of Russia, and to find strength and collective security in the European family of nations. So um, why did I say 90% of Americans should support? What, what, I, what do I think about the other 10? Well, I suppose some people hold such idiosyncratic views or such extreme views that they could not, under any circumstances, defend even classical liberalism, the liberalism of John Locke, the liberalism of the Declaration of Independence, which is what very much was the logic of Euromaidan, the right of the people to prevent a political catastrophe on their land, the right of the people to depose the government that has become so clearly um, uh, uh, alien to the public interest, that has so fundamentally breached the trust the social contract, its own promises of European integration and democratization. Um, America, uh, Ukrainian revolution was Lockean and was in many ways reminiscent of the American revolution. Is it an immaculate thing? Is it a pure and clean thing? No. But in this world, I don't think we expect immaculate, pure um, things. We just hope that we're making better choices as opposed to worse choices. And, and we know that the struggles against corruption, against all sorts of human failures are always with us. And I'll close on this. Um, is, this is the mic working about right? Can everybody hear me? So um, I can tell already that Alena and I are going to have a good deal to disagree with, so um, <laughs> we're just going to have to do that. Um, the initial thoughts, the first thing I, when I was taking notes to myself about what I wanted to mention in the initial discussion was, I just got it to myself, Ukrainian nationalist narratives. And um, the United States press um, has presented uh, a great deal of a Ukrainian narrative, um, a, a narrative of Ukrainian history, which is essentially a narrative of Russia oppressing Ukraine and you can see dates going back to as far as the 1600s when not only did Ukraine not exist, but modern Russia did not exist. Um, and I think that we need to problematize um, these narratives. And I also want to challenge our own statement that Ukrainian nationalism is, as if it were a monolithic entity, about liberalism. Um, I would say that there are many Ukrainian nationalisms um, Ukraine has a history which um, it wants to downplay desperately now, widespread collaboration with the Nazi invasion and the Holocaust. Um, an attempt is now being, in my opinion, made to erase that memory by focusing on the mass death of Ukrainians under Stalin and the whole other war, which is an 
an alternate um, and real mass murder. And there are elements of Ukrainian nationalism which are, in fact, neo-Nazi. And the Svoboda Party, which made up probably, well, they won, I don't know, 10, about 10, 12 percent of votes in parliamentary elections, something like this, um, I believe, in 2010, is, and, and which is within the current government, albeit a minority, is pretty clearly um, anti-feminist, um, anti-democratic, anti-liberal, you don't have to scratch very far statements at their local rallies, rallies to find anti-Semitism. Now, this is not to say or to accept the Russian narrative that the Euromaidan movement is entirely or even dominated by these folks, but we need to be aware that these folks are there. Um, I don't, I think that what Putin is doing in Ukraine is um, both internationally, uh, I think it's illegal and I think it's a much more serious threat to um, world stability than anything the so-called war on terror has, has brought us, particularly um, his claim to defend um, Russians, and particularly he means Russians, and what the Russians refer to as the so-called near abroad, that is the areas that were once incorporated as republics to the Soviet Union. And um, this is an extremely dangerous claim. Um, on the other hand, to understand what's going on, we do need to understand that there are Russian points of view here. So, first of all, um, the Maidan movement overthrew a democratically elected government, um, and that was uh, elected with, um, you know, there, nobody challenged the legitimacy of that election. Secondly, the, um, the president, Yanukovych, was impeached um, in using a procedure that has no relation to what's in the Ukrainian the impeachment procedure in the Ukrainian Constitution. Um, one of the fundamental issues here from the Russian point of view, at least leaders of the Russian state, is the question of um, integration into NATO. And um, there's a lot of speculation on what Putin's motives were when he went into Crimea, for example. Um, I guess I go back and forth on this kind of thing, but I guess my take is that um, he viewed Maidan as a step towards um, Ukrainian integration into NATO, um, which Russia, Russian leaders at any rate, would pretty much view as an existential threat. And um, that it's not, I don't agree with that assessment. It's not surprising to me that that's how they would assess the situation. Um, I'm just going over some points that I jotted down here. I, I don't have a, a particular thread uh, I want to follow in the initial comments. Um, I want to stress that this is, it, this is not about America. Um, and both, we have, a, we have a narrative dominant U.S. press stating that um, this is about um, you know, Putin confronting the United States, um, a new Cold War, a new war for freedom, the United States has to step in on Ukraine's side. And, and um, I think that narrative is oversimplified. I also think that the narrative that somehow the United States engineered the Maidan movement and made all this happen, um, you know, overthrew the Yanukovych government as part of a nefarious attempt to expand NATO is also, um, is also actually America-centric. And, um, and, and this is really not about America. I mean, Ukraine's trade ties and Russia's trade ties with the United States are absolutely negligible. Um, so, I think that there are some questions, you know, the questions that are in my mind and have been in my mind since the beginning of this crisis are, um, you know, first of all, what are Putin's motives and what are the future steps he's going to take? And, you know, I'm, luckily I'm not a political scientist, so I don't have to pretend to be a predictor, but at points I've sort of made predictions which have proven wrong that the Russians were about to invade eastern Ukraine. Um, I can go into why that would actually probably be quite foolish of them, but I, I won't go into that now. Um, my overall take is that the Maidan precipitated that, that Putin and his and his associates saw Maidan as an existential threat. Um, 
the future steps, the Crimean movement, had the Crimean takeover had certainly been wargamed beforehand because it was done extremely well. Um, however, I, I think that Putin, it, it, had been, it was a contingent plan. I don't think this has been planned a long way ahead. My sense now is that Putin is reacting to the flow of events. Another question, which I've alluded to a little bit, which is under heavy debate and which I have not seen good studies of, is who, you know, who are the, who actually was on the square in Maidan um, in Kiev. And I suspect that um, the other two commentators can tell more about that than I can. Um, Another theme to all of this is the, is the incredible weakness of the Ukrainian state. The Ukrainian state, um, um, for better or for worse, and probably for worse, but it's, but it's a reality, Putin was able to um, suppress the independent power of the oligarchs in Russia. Um, this has not happened in Ukraine, and the Ukrainian government, as a result, has been it's been, a, it's been a very weak state, as witnessed in the inability of it to get, of the, the government to get its own police forces and military to follow orders during this crisis. Um, one lens through which one can view Ukrainian politics, which explains the most, is really um, a, a ongoing competition between oligarchs um, for economic resources. And um, Poroshenko, the new, pre, uh, the new president, has been a, a lesser player in this, which is why some people may view him as, as a lesser evil. He doesn't have as, enough, as much wealth as some of the biggest magnates, um, like um, Minab Um But at any rate, the, if you look at, for example, the positions the Ukrainian political parties take, they don't really matter much. What matters is where an oligarch is positioning himself at a, at a specific time. Um, I think with regard to what's happening right now, I wonder, the frightening thing that I wonder about is whether Putin has lost control of the Russian separatists in the East. Now, I probably, to a greater extent than Alin, I think that there is local involvement in the, um, in the separatist movement in the East. Um, I agree with her completely that um, overall, even in, Dumb in the uh, Donetsk and Lugansk regions, overall, there was not large-scale support for unification with the Russian Federation. There was a poll done in February or March, a couple of polls, which both suggested about one-third of the population might support union with the Russian Federation. Um, I should stop there um, and, and let things proceed. Um, I think that we, one of the things that, um, when Americans talk about um, world affairs that we have a lot of trouble acknowledging is simply that other countries have national interests. And, um, and for that, when we have national interests, it's all couched in terms of humanitarian goals. Now, I, um, I'm completely uninterested in apologizing for Putin's authoritarian regime. I'm completely um, uninterested in romanticizing uh, the present Russian regime in any way. Um, we also have to recognize that Russian leaders will act in accordance with their perception of Russian self-interest, and we should not be shocked uh, or surprised by that. Thanks. So it was about it was about two months, two and a half months ago that I was in Moscow, and I got a call and saying, you know, hey. You know, the organization you're working for, but you guys all finance indirectly through your taxes, State Department funded. Uh, we got close. You got to leave. You know, it's Tuesday. You got to leave on Sunday. By Sunday, the latest, the whole office. And at that moment, the first thing that I remembered was uh, a course I had taken back in 2006 at Indiana University on Russian uh, foreign policy. And I remember we did role. We all did role plays. My role play was to act as a national politician and to theorize a strategy of taking back Crimea for the Russian state. This was just to try to understand the various threads of foreign policy you know, uh, that, that exist in the Russian Federation as of 2006. Plenty of literature on this. This is not something that came out of nowhere um, you know, in February for sure. 
Um, so what I'm going to try to do very quickly is just uh, more interested in just trying to get a deeper understanding of perspectives. Uh, and I was originally going to start Ukraine and then work my way backwards towards uh, the U.S. and the West, but I decided actually to start the other way around and start with the U.S. and the West and then um, uh, work your way to Russia and then to Ukraine. Um, I think we all have, a, you know, some disagreements, some things in common. Um, I'm probably somewhere between the two of them. Uh, but I think the one thing I want to start is, you know, I think the U.S. media tends to uh, be black and white about a lot of things. And I think I've, we've heard this uh, already here today. You know, we create heroes and we create villains. And it's, it's you know, the dominant narrative you always see in the media. And I, I think it's important to remember, I think, in Ukraine that there are no heroes uh, in the sense that, you know, uh, there's no victories right now. Um, and there's a lot of guilt be spread around, I think, except for you know, probably a vast majority of the Ukrainian people. Uh, and I'm not taking into account too much uh, the, the, the very current you know, Ukrainian government. But I think it's important to remember, you know, uh, Yanukovych, I agree, you know, with the actual government policies, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, it was an illegal impeachment, et cetera, et cetera. But he still lost his legitimacy when he started, I think, you know, opening uh, ordering troops to open fire. How much control he had over that situation is still unclear. It was just very messy, you know, and, and definitely like January, February, and March being in Russia was, you know, among the uh, greatest political tension <laughs> I've ever I've ever felt in my life, you know, and political related stress I've probably ever felt. Um, but, you know, I do believe it was a revolution. It was not, a, I don't believe it was a coup. You know, in Russia, I think this is completely lost. In America, I think this is lost um, because U.S. media tend to think, well, Ukrainians clearly they want to be like us, you know, and that's and that's why they're doing this. And they don't want to be like Russia, as if it's a choice that that that's that simple. And while elements I think of this can be somewhat true, uh, I think most importantly, Ukrainians want a functioning government, you know, that speaks, you know, and acts in their interest. Um, okay, I, I just I'm, I'm I'm fearful, but optimistic that this is not true. But I would I hope we don't have to, you know, 20 years from now look back at 1991 to 2014 as being similar to 1918 to 1939, um, in terms of being an inter-war, inter-Cold War period. Okay, um, my experiences in Russia, um, you know, and, and how Europe also, you know, if we, if we include Europe, I mean, there is some difference of opinion on certain aspects of, of relations with Russia. For sure, Germany in the past, in particular, at certain times, has been a little bit more friendlier. Uh, I'm willing, more willing to work with Russia than they probably are now. Um, but with some exception, you know, Europe acts similar uh, as we do, you know, in terms of relations. Uh, but, you know, of course they're much closer in terms of, you know, geography, history, and trade. And it was funny, uh, one, the first time I went to Helsinki was 2002 or 2003, Helsinki, Finland, on a, just a visa run from St. Petersburg. And I remember uh, the woman, the Finnish woman at the hospital was like, uh, oh, you from, you're coming from Russia. Yes, have you been? No. I'm like, it's just right there. She's like, yes, that's the problem. It's just right there. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, American foreign policy to Russia, I think, having examined this issue over the last 10, 12, 13 years, has been at times a bit patronizing, a bit naive, and a bit unequal. Um, if we think about the 1990s, uh, you know, we were, we were American economists were uh, largely responsible, you know, for, for giving a lot of advice that was how we saw things, you know, without really, you know, trying to understand uh, local conditions a little better. But I mean, you can also still see it today. I mean, why didn't we go, why, why did we send uh, only, you know, uh, only lower level people to the Olympics, for example? I mean, we've, we've got a very well documented history of snubs, uh, you know. Uh, with Russia, and we seem to hold different countries to different standards, which kind of annoys me. You know, here we, you know, we've heard plenty, and, and not that I agree with any of Russia's policies, especially regarding you know, gay people, but, you know, are we going to say the same thing to Qatar when they have the World Cup? In the upcoming years, I don't think we are. But, well, who knows? Uh, you know, uh, I think this is kind of uh, indicative of how things are going in the U.S., you know, look at our Congress, you know, but you have to be ideologically pure, which puts kind of perspectives into a black body so I, just for example, I was looking for figures on the Russian economy of the early 90s to them, 
and came upon an article titled 1990 to 1992, early 1990s recession, a working paper by the University of California, Berkeley. There was no mention of Russia or the Soviet Union as if there's nothing going on uh, <laughs> in that part of the world during that time, as if that did not contribute at all to uh, you know, any kind of recession that would have happened in the United States. Uh, you know, American-centric, certainly. Consider this figure. In its first decade as a market-oriented economy, the Russian economy suffered a contraction of nearly 60% of over pre-independence levels as measured by GDP. Every time we go down a quarter of a percent, it's like extreme crisis, right? So you can imagine how difficult. We, I feel like it's lost in the U.S. media uh, how difficult for Russia, for Ukraine, for, other, for all countries, for the former Soviet Union, just how difficult uh, that transition was. And, you know, I think in terms of understanding, you know, that Russia dealt with that and then dealt with the crisis of 98 and then dealt with a pretty serious recession that has recovered more slowly than, um, you know, we have in 2008, 2009, you know, uh, it's important to remember that, you know, why Putin has support is because Russians want stability, you know, and history weighs on people's minds in Russia for certain. Uh, you know, we completely underestimate this. You know, um, let's go to Russia. <laughs> how Russia understands Ukraine. I'll give you a, a bit of an example. This comes from part of the uh, of what I used uh, when I was discussing uh, the, the role play about uh, nationalist view of yeah, Ukraine. I'm going to quote Vladimir Zhirinovsky in his book. Uh, he's a politician. He runs a political party. Uh, Russia and Ukraine, uh, one land, one people. In my understanding, Ukraine always was. This is a, this is a prominent politician of Russia today. In my understanding, Ukraine always was and remains a part of the Russian lands. In Kiev, as in the case of Novgorod, these are the headwaters of Russian nationhood. In terms of what concerns Ukrainian, Ukrainians, I see them as a southern Russian people, with a certain anthropological influence of ancient nomadic tribes, and in the western regions, a Polish influence. Incidentally, the Russian people in the center and east of our country did not avoid the influence, for example, from the side of the Turkic or ergo Finnic uh, peoples. These are all natural historical processes which practically all peoples have been subjected to, all the nationalities of the earth. But this does not mean that they must be, all be divided into separate detached nations. Therefore, I do not distinguish Ukrainians from Russians or Russians from Ukrainians, but the Ukrainians and Belarusians, as well as the Russians, must be proud of the fact that they are all people of one Eastern Slavic root. This is a very, uh, you know, kind of, uh, very nationalistic perspective on Ukraine. But this is, this is something, you know, I've seen in a different form or another on Russian television in prime time on a daily basis in February and March. Uh, this is an interesting uh, quote I heard recently from historian Julianne Furst in trying to understand the, the, rift, the current rift between Russia and the West. And she says that the current rift between Russia and the West is not a conflict in which one side is guilty of aggression and the other side is a victim. Uh, it is not about whose newspapers write the truth and whose politicians are more hypocritical. It is not even really a rift about the question of Crimean nationhood, Ukrainian government, or NATO enlargement. Rather, the current conflict is a culmination of historical processes that shape Russia's atti Russian attitudes towards the West. When Angela Merkel spoke of Putin's other world, she hit the nail firmly on its head. It is not as many in the American media have reported that Putin is crazy, which is a crass mistranslation of the German original, but that Putin and a great many Russian people live in a universe shaped by forces and experiences that are completely outside the realm of Western imagination and understanding. At the same time, this universe has acted as a very effective barrier uh, to Russian understanding of the West. Uh, let me just uh, finish up, I, don't, I didn't plan as well as I should have, um, but uh, you know, I do think that uh, Russia is interested today as being, honestly, I, this is my impression, a conservative Christian alternative to the West in a lot of ways. Uh, anti-gay, anti-drug, anti-decency with all these you know, decency laws uh, that have been passed very recently. You know, and Russia definitely has become, uh, to me, in general, like talking to my father, right? You know, only discuss safe topics because politics will all automatically lead to argument. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. Hopefully, I can get back to some of my other points. Then. Does that seem okay with everybody?
and I'll just try to be like some sort of a timekeeper. Um, I was actually realizing um, as a member of the Ukrainian community here in Rochester, I just wanted to again make note and thank Doug for working with us and think that this is a, a, a kind of a major thing to get folks in the Ukrainian community working with folks um, in um, the non-Ukrainian community here in Rochester. Um, and you know what, when you had said to me, you know, maybe you should moderate, and I thought to myself, okay, I've never moderated, and you're gonna have me moderate a discussion where people talk about Russia and Ukraine. <laughs> yeah, good times. Um, <laughs> yeah, good times. But I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old. Um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I've spent some time overnight at a homeless shelter on Hudson Ave. So I think I'm qualified. <laughs> um, but given that, yeah, why don't we just, we'll do questions up at the podium, and if there's somebody in the way, way far back, I'll try to grab the mic. Um, and, and, and run that way. Or if you want to just shout it out, I'll try to rephrase your question if it's less than 10 words. Yes. I have read that Stalin gave, and put that in quotes, the Crimea to the Ukraine. Is that true? Was, the, was, the, was the Crimea part of the Ukraine? Part of Ukraine, not the Ukraine. Part of Ukraine. Ukraine. Okay. Um, did Stalin give Crimea to Ukraine? Do you want me to take that one? Sure. Um, who Crimea, quote unquote, who Crimea, quote unquote, belongs to is an interesting question. I think what you're referencing is the fact that I, I think in '56, Nikita Khrushchev um, shifted Crimea into um, made Crimea part of the Ukrainian Republic, at least not before. There's a lot of debate about why he did this. Um, I feel from studying the era pretty closely that he needed, in his battle with um, remaining Stalinists in the party leadership, he needed the support of um, Ukrainian members of the Central Committee, and that was why he did this. Um, Putin claimed, um, I don't know, about two months ago that uh, Crimea has quote unquote always been part of Russia. Um, Crimea was, that's of course nonsense, um, until from uh, the 1400s until the late 18th century, um, Crimea was uh, the seat of the so-called Crimean Khanate, the Crimean Tatars who speak a Turkic language, um, were those folks. Um, for much of the time, they were client state of the Ottomans, um, had a more or less hostile relationship to Russia, uh, raiding for slaves and so on. Uh, Russia finally conquered the area in the late uh, 1700s. Um, an interesting question, which perhaps all in knows the answer to, is, is this. Um, the first independent Ukrainian state was declared in 1918, existed in 1918 to 1919, and I don't know if that state claimed uh, Crimea or not within its frontiers. Somebody's shaking their head in the back. Um, go. It, it was uh, sort of, a, the maps were shifting very rapidly. Um, what's interesting is, uh, not even so much Crimea, but um, uh, in 1917, 1918, uh, during the civil war, the revolutionary processes, uh, the short-lived Ukrainian state um, also considered uh, uniting with similarly short-lived Cossack state in the Kuban region of Russia, um, which uh, the people which have uh, significant ties and are, are in, uh, to a significant percentage ethnic Ukrainians. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not even sure um, that uh, as, as much of a respect as I have for history and historical explanations, um, I think uh, the argument about the Crimea ought to turn onto um, certain, certain uh, norms of international relations um, that we aspire to have after the tragedies of World War I and World War II. And those include not not trespassing the borders of the nations, not raising the question of what was whose land at some point in history. Those questions are too dangerous and we can, countries can choose <coughs> very different form of development of and self-actualization um, other than collecting or adding to their territories. Um, so that would be my short. I would just add on to it as well. Yeah, I mean, it was a complete, I mean, that was the craziest two weeks of my life was the period from when, I think it was what, March 1st, 
I woke up and uh, I've been to a wedding the night before. And I wake up and uh, yes, uh, Russia is taking Crimea. Within two weeks, it was you know ratified, so to speak, and you know maps started changing, and you know all sorts of murals are being painted on the sides of buildings in uh, in Moscow and other and other places, and there's dem nationalist demonstrations everywhere. Of course, if you have a different opinion, absolutely, you'll be arrested immediately. <laughs> Um, but I think it's important, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Matthew uh, alluded to it a little bit, you know, I think it's important to remember what, you know, Russia had in Crimea as well. I mean, it was, I think, very concerned that a nationalist government, I think, would come in and, and, and uh, disrupt their rights that they have leased uh, for, the, for the Russian Black Sea Fleet, which is located in Sebastopol. Um, but, you know, I mean, the most important thing is, you know, uh, it, was, it was a complete sham, I felt, the, the, the whole referendum. Um, and, I mean, let's just remember, you know, uh, Ukraine gave up the, the world's third largest nuclear weapons stockpile between 94 and 96 as a result of the Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurances, which included security assurances against threats or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of Ukraine, as well as Belarus and Kazakhstan. And so that was complete fly completely in the face of, uh, of that agreement. Okay, thanks. Just a little housekeeping note. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have this mic pointed this way, so I think sometimes when people are like kind of lined up to ask questions, that's also helpful to keep things going. Um, and then that mic that we're not using, I'm gonna set up over there, so just while we're answering the next question, all right, does that seem fair? Just trying to run through as many questions as possible. So I think if, if we can try to, if you're asking a question, find the panelists that you want to answer the question, maybe to be as focused so we can kind of move through a little bit. Okay, all right, yeah. in the back, I saw that hand go up quickly, so we'll go there. Okay, we're having a pass. Next, somebody else? Yeah, hi. Uh, I can't understand the, the uh, uh, point of view of the Russian-speaking uh, folks living in eastern uh, uh, um, Ukraine. Um, wh why, uh, what, what's been done to them that they're so upset that they want to join in Russia? Uh, I mean, I can understand the point of view. I not necessarily agree with uh, uh, the Russian, uh, Putin, point of view, uh, uh, and the American point of view, uh, and the Ukrainian government, and the, the Western Ukrainian government, uh, and, and all the other people in, in, involved. But I, I just don't understand why people who are living in a country of uh, uh, Ukraine, even though they, they have the Russian uh, a pedigree, that they're so interested in, uh, in joining into uh, uh, Russia today. I'd like to call on Bell and I can go first. Uh, so here's my understanding uh, for clarity and personal explanation. Um, my family is, and I grew up uh, in the north of Ukraine, in the region of Chernihiv, which is borders both Belarus and Russia. So it's quite a distance from both the west, the very western part of Ukraine city of Lviv and a long distance to Donetsk and Luhansk regions. What has been done, the short answer is television. Um, <laughs> surprising as it may be probably to those of you who, in whose lives television is playing less and less of a role. Um, television still plays uh, a, an enormously prominent role um, in forming the world views of, um, um, of of people who live in Donetsk and Luhansk, of people who live in Russia. Um, internet penetration is very low. Um, and the situation that uh, existed there was such that um, the residents of those regions overwhelmingly were watched for years, Russian uh, television channels. That is the most, the shortest distance explanation to what has really happened. Um, before I get to another point, I actually wanted to comment on something that Joe said. Joe quoted Zhirinovsky and his view on Ukraine. Uh, as, as bizarre and, and dangerous as that is, it's not quite as dangerous of what Vladimir Putin um, says himself. Um, for Zhirinovsky is obviously uh, a politician, 
But, right, but, but uh, Vladimir Putin is a president of the Russian Federation. And today, um, it seems that Putin has introduced even a new twist to his language on Ukraine. So previously, he spoke of the right and intention of the Russian Federation to, de to defend uh, Russians, ethnic Russians, and Russian speakers. Today, a third category of people in need of defense has been added, and that is people, which may be neither ethnic Russian nor Russian speakers, although they're likely to be at least one of those, most likely, but not necessarily. The third category, which may overlap but also be distinct, is people who, and I'm translating this new term that I encountered today, have unbreakable links to Russia, and I would say the common fraternal past with Russia. So basically parts of Brighton Beach um, are included in this. It's mostly folks who are, you know, like all of us, have a touch, maybe more than a touch of nostalgia in them, who have fond memories of their youth, no matter if it was spent in authoritarian regimes, <laughs> and who doesn't? Um, so, um, so it is very dangerous uh, what kind of terminology and behind terminology stands policy and intention uh, is, is enunciated by the very top of Russian leadership. Um, uh, to go back to the uh, citizen, to the residents of, of Luhansk and Donetsk, um, they've lost uh, the government, though corrupt and criminal, uh, whose roots were firmly in Donetsk. So it's kind of Texans on the election night when Bush loses. And Texans, as you know, immediately begin to petition to secede. And that's no joke, because as you know, Texans have collected the highest number of signatures this January, uh, right, or was it January 2013? January 2013, what is it, 125,000 signatures the Texans gave to the petition to secede? They've exceeded the 100,000 requirement, and so the administration, President Obama, had to issue a letter to each and every one of the Texans who to petition to secede. So they suffered political loss. That's one, that's one reason for their anger. And that's a very simple one that anybody whose candidate for president did not win would understand, right? So, I mean, didn't you wish to go to Canada at certain points after a certain election? <laughs> Right, maybe not secede, but certainly at least secede your own household. Um, and um, there's, uh, there's also a very uh, you know, pathetic, sad economic situation in those regions. The claims of the uh, discrimination on the basis of language are um, really, really lack legitimacy. Um, in other words, this is uh, a protest against uh, a singular state language. This is perhaps the kind of grievances that you would hear from ordinary people, and we ought to listen to them, but they were on the level of, you know, my drugs come with explanatory notes in Ukrainian, or, you know, um, official documents must be filled out in Ukrainian, even though there's plenty of people around to help. Um, they wanted to make that case, or, especially one to me stuck, stuck out in my memory. Somebody said, who I think was an ethnic Russian, if these are Russian, yes, I think they were Russian. They said, our children are almost Ukrainian. And what that meant is that a part of them uh, was uh, grieving the fact that uh, their children, who are perhaps are ethnically Russian, but uh, have been educated for some years in Ukrainian school, um, now have a feeling of belonging to the nation of Ukraine which I think is something to celebrate in a multicultural state. Uh, but, but for some, it also targeted some kind of hard strings. Um, we gotta tell this woman that we gotta leave her at nine o'clock. <laughs> we don't want the complete history of the, of the country. We want answers okay. that, that are being questioned here. Sorry. Okay. So, I have quick. a couple of comments Sound here. I, I don't even need to, I don't even need that. Uh, yeah, you do. Yeah. All right. So, um, as was said before, the fact is that um, most of the the line between Russian and Ukrainian is blurred throughout Ukraine, but especially in East-West Ukraine, uh, in, in Eastern Ukraine, rather. 
folks have, well, yes, south, I mean, throughout Ukraine. Um, more than two-thirds of the population in all of these areas, except possibly the far west, are bilingual. The families are intermarried. Um, I, national identification is, is, is blurry. It's also fact that, in fact, two-thirds of the population of Donetsk and Lugansk regions, as far as the polls suggest, don't want to join the Russian Federation. There are no documented, there's no documented evidence of Ukrainian government abuse of the Russian-speaking population. Language has been a political football for years, which politicians have used to scare people or win their support. Yanukovych, when he was in, during the election campaign in 2010, promised to make Russian the official language of Ukraine, and as soon as he took power, he just threw that right out. Um, I think that what we're seeing here, the deep tragedy may be that folks who have lived together on the ground for at least two generations um, without difficulty may be forced into a situation where they are choosing sides and we may get the development of civil war and ethnic cleansing. Uh, God forbid we do. but. But it's a real, what's developing here is a real historical tragedy because Ukrainians and Russians have generally not had difficulties living side by side throughout much of what is today Ukraine. 